truth is, as she says in another place, God is all-powerful and is all-merciful, and therefore you can never, never have too much confidence in him. On the contrary, to our audacity in trusting in God is the virtue, rather than our hesitation to. But our own interior misgivings make that leap of faith and trust very <laughs> difficult, uh, unless you keep working at this thing and begin to see God helping you without apparently doing so, not in a way that you would like, at least. And so the, the, the hiddenness of God's presence is so hidden that the only way you can really be sure of its working is in the results. And the results are not grandiose, as we saw in the parable of the mustard seed, but are real. And these can be the little improvements. We may not have a magnificent conversion, but we keep ever so faithfully and persistently pursuing this path of the little way and little sacrifices until we begin to notice that our attitudes towards events and people are changed. Now, how are they changed? They're changed because our expectations have been released. We don't have a human projection about God or our own ideas of how God should proceed, even if they're developed from spiritual books. You can be sure that whatever you think is the way of going to God isn't. <laughs> because even if you were right, and you can find, quote, certain spiritual authors to help you, just because you think you're on the right road, God will find another road that's just as good so you won't think you're on the right road. <laughs> it, it, it's our false certitude in our preconceptions and biases and value system that are the great hindrance. So, so this openness to God coming to us in daily life through events and people is, is, is an important, a very important way of grasping There's one other parable I'd like to conclude on, and, and this is really a delightful parable and very close to our experience if you, if you think about it a little while. It's the parable of the barren fig tree. You remember the story? Uh, this man, uh, householder, he said to his gardener, this tree, this fig tree has not had any fruit for three years. Please cut it down. And the gardener said, uh, why don't you put a little, let me put a little manure around it? And, uh, and if it doesn't do better in a year, then I will cut it down. That's the end of the parable. Well, what, what could that mean? <laughs> well, it, it, it seems to me that, that it's a very powerful symbol of how we experience daily life if you're trying to be transformed, if you're trying to take on the mind of Christ, to put into effect the values of the gospel, and to manifest the fruits of the Spirit, charity, joy, and peace, insofar as the Spirit gives you that uh, wonderful consolation. Well, uh, the manure is, 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 means dung, of course. I'll leave out other words. Uh, but those, that's the word actually Jesus used, so it's a very down-to-earth term. Uh, it has a certain pungency. <laughs> so you, we know what we're talking about here, but for some reason, trees like dung. So what's poison for one is, is a chocolate cake for somebody else. Well, the dung, then, 
is the symbol of our experience of daily life and of our constantly recurring faults and routines and the sense of going nowhere, the inability to pray, the dryness, the endless flow of thoughts going by. All, all the psychological experiences of how hard prayer is, how hard daily life is, and, and nothing really helps. Uh, turning on the television is, well, it gives you a brief surcease of but then you're back in the same old hole and perhaps deeper. So that, so that all the means we use to assuage that, that pain of daily life, of not getting anywhere, is not the way to proceed. It's rather to shovel the dung. That is, to keep accepting, to keep putting up with one's faults, to keep putting up with one's moral corruption which is the worst kind of level to have to deal with. And still trusting in God. But now, all the manure in the world isn't going to change that tree. So you know that from the beginning. But what you, what you don't know is that if you keep shoveling, at some point, God is going to give life to that tree. Not because of the dung, but because you kept trying, and he was so touched that he gave life to you anyway. Therese had a great insight into that parable when, in her example of the uh, elevator. Perhaps you remember that. Uh, somebody asked her about, well, how, do you, how, how did you reach this holiness that you have, and so on. Well, she tended to acknowledge that she was she had a little insight into being holy, but she attributed it all to God. So this is the little parable she gave to explain that. She said, suppose, suppose there was this little infant at the bottom of a long staircase uh, with the, her father at the top. And this little infant is maybe one and a half. And the steps are fairly significant, eight inches. So she's calling out to her father, to, to come and catch her and give her a big embrace. Come down and catch me. And the father is up at the top of the stairs saying, come on, come on. Uh, all through the gospel you get that invitation. Come on and be transformed and forget your faults and get your sins and just be in the present moment and I'll take care of you and all the other things the scripture reassures us about. But because we're not like little children, we don't hear that. Well, anyway, she was like a little child, and she heard it. And, and so she said, the little child keeps raising her foot. Notice the effort. But there's no chance of her getting to the first step, even, because her leg is too small. So she keeps raising it, and then it comes down. And she raises the other, and that comes down. So there's no, opportunity, no chance at all that she's even going to negotiate the first step to get to daddy, who's calling her with this infinite love. Come on, come on, I'm waiting for you. So she keeps doing it, she keeps doing it. In other words, she keeps shoveling the manure, her feebleness, her experience, and accepting her weakness, her inability to make any progress, to get anywhere. She keeps saying yes, yes. But she doesn't give up, even though it's impossible. And Teresa says, well, if she keeps this up long enough, the father himself, because of his nature of unconditional love, will not be able to stand this situation and will come rushing down and gather her into his arms and take her upstairs. And she said, that's how she got where she was, not by her own efforts, but by the infinite mercy of God. This is why I say Therese's insight into the gospel is one of the great contributions to spiritual renewal in our time, especially to the renewal of contemplative life, which is the way of little, of, of childhood, that is, of listening to God, of waiting for God, of trusting in God, of having faith in God, of not listening to our commentaries that say you're not getting anywhere or you'll never make it if you don't enter the Trappist. Or <laughs> 
you can never make it with this husband. You can never make it with these children. You can never make it with this bankruptcy. You can never make it with this addiction. These are all real difficulties. I don't want to minimize them. But God is, is, is using them to give you the kingdom. And the kingdom is conditional only on your consent. Acceptance of the situation. You can try to change the situation, but always with a certain detachment. If it doesn't work, no sweat. Because you're basically willing to accept what is as the communication, the deepest communication of the kingdom. And that's where the kingdom is most powerful. And it's absolutely certain to work, not because of your efforts, which you have to keep up, even though it's hopeless, <laughs> but because God loves you so much that he won't be able to stand it, seeing you struggle and not succeed. And he will do it. Now that's, that is the heart of the Christian ascesis or mystery or transformation. And it's something that Therese recovered in its essence through her simplicity and her, her extraordinary love of God, which went to great lengths to do everything for God. So is this so hard? Everybody can love and everybody can suffer. Well, that's all you need. <laughs> it, it's all, it gets a little uncomfortable now and then, but also it perks up every now and then. But it doesn't matter because God is totally present always. And whatever psychological experience we have, is, is, even when it's our fault, is a way that God is, is trying to alert us to the fact that we need to let something go, that something we're attached to, or some idea, prejudice, is, is, is putting us into a straitjacket. So this little way is the path of liberation from the fault self. Liberation from over-identification with our feelings. We have feelings, but we're not our feelings. So we should never say, I'm angry, or I'm dis despaired. But we should say, rather, I have angry feelings. <laughs> Which implies, you, yes, and you can do something about it. Because you're not identified with your feelings. You can choose what to do with them and with all the other feelings. And it's that uh, effort to do that, which doesn't succeed, which leaves you with the sense of manure, Juicy manure. <laughs> but it doesn't matter if, you, if it's your attitude that is changing and which and it gives you a sort of friendly attitude towards your feebleness and failings. Now, we should work on our addictions, yes, at least for the sake of other people, not for our own. <laughs> but only God can deliver us, and he delivers us after a wait, not because he wants to wait, but because we're not ready to be healed until we've kind of hit bottom and know that we can't do it ourselves and that only God's grace, his infinite mercy, can, can provide. That's reality. So how to adjust to that is, is the Christian path of discipline and ascesis. And that's why some disciplines that are external can become harmful after a while because we put our confidence in them or we think if we do this, we're going to force God to do something. No, oh, God only responds to love. That's what forces him. But that's what's so free that you can't call it a force. It's a relationship. <laughs> and it's that relationship in which Teresa died and her last words were what her life had become, not from the beginning, but increasingly. Oh, my God, I love you. That's, that's really all we have to do. I'll add one more parable here. A parable of the Good Samaritan. This, this parable also 
It describes the social map of Israel and, and the, uh, which was very, very rigid. And so we find three people, four people on the journey, one who gets beaten up, as you remember, and then comes a priest and a Levite from the temple. And, and the third person would normally be a, a lay person in this Israelite uh, uh, preconditioning of consciousness. So the story is very uh, cleverly put together so that it builds up a certain expectation that the triad that is so familiar to people of the social structure of the time, priest, Levite, and layperson, would be repeated. And we have to remember that Samaritans at the time were the mortal enemies of the Jewish nation, and they're also apostates from the faith in their opinion. So they, they couldn't be a more precise image of moral corruption coming down the street. So the, the audience is, is inclined to think, well, who, who's coming next? And sure enough, along comes a Samaritan, the mortal enemy of people, and they just think, well, he'll, he'll just finish off this poor man who's by the side of the road. But instead, the Samaritan begins to show all kinds of mercy, as you remember. And uh, the point of this story is obviously to undermine the social presuppositions of that period of Palestinian society and, and, and to indicate that one who you think is your enemy may be your greatest friend. So it, it, it undermines the easy assumption of what is good and what is evil. So what happens in this story is it's just a reversal, and it's a familiar theme, I guess, in stories ever since. The good guy becomes the bad guys, and the bad guy becomes the good guy. And leaving the people there to wonder whether this story could be true or whether it's, it's just unbelievable, and they would write it off as of no interest. So it emphasizes then the, the idea that there is no, there are no barriers in the kingdom of heaven. There are no social structures, at least that God wants. There are, that, that barriers are something that human beings set up, not God. And if we're not careful, these barriers could follow us perhaps into the next life and to separate us from other people. So it em emphasizes then that God is, is, is the father of, of everyone and there are no elite, there are no chosen because everybody is chosen in God's view and he loves, desires all persons to be saved. Well, it, it's this idea of God that was kind of revolutionary to the people of the time who were thinking of God as a... As a defender of Israel, as the God of armies, as the God of Sinai. And, and what Jesus does is to revolutionize the idea of God from someone to be feared into someone to be loved and whose, whose protection extends beyond external circumstances to enable us to endure within ourselves through the love of God circumstances that are otherwise very difficult or even impossible. So this was Therese's idea of God, of extending to everybody. And so in the last few months of her life, she, she used to say, love fulfills every vocation. So, so you, don't, you don't have to go to the missions. <laughs> you don't have to teach catechism. You don't have to do this or that work. You have to do something that is what is nearby and what you can easily do to, to minister to the emotional, physical, mental needs of others. It's this sensitivity in daily life and showing mercy and reaching out and, and, and smiling to those in trouble and 
holding the hand of those in sorrow. And it, it, it is these things that manifest the kingdom of God so beautifully. And uh, to love fulfills every vocation. Or as she said in another place, to pick up a pin out of love can convert a somebody. So, so, so think then of the enormous potentialities of this humble, hidden, but persevering love that consists not in sentiment so much, but in showing love to those who need it in the circumstances of daily life, in the family, at work, or wherever. And, and just keep showing love. And to do our little acts. So we walk down the street. Why are you doing that? Why not do it as a way of manifesting God and, and allowing your presence to God through you to send out good energy and, and love to everybody on the sidewalk? Uh, when you go to the movies or to church when there's a big crowd or like this crowd, why not open your hearts to everybody and ask God to send his love into everybody as though you were surrounding them in a kind of Encapsulate, encapsulating them in the love of God. Or to ask yourself, how can I show love more to this person? How can I be reconciled with this member of the family? It, it, it's love that counts, and that, I'll have this one last parable. In the parable of the prodigal son, you have two sinners. One, the, the, the young man who went out for the good life and came to ruin and came home and was received without any request for repentance or, or to uh, repay the money that he'd spent, which really injustice he should have done because that was part of that was part of the, to take care of his father, the inheritance in his old age. And the other young man who was one of those uh, self-righteous people who do all the right things but for the wrong reasons. He was looking for the inheritance too and he had a right to be angry at his brother because he because he had spent all of his, it would mean that the eldest son would have to pay more for the support of the old man. But he berates his father for his goodness, this is, so that he really fails in the fourth commandment of honoring his father. So the net-net is that both have failed, but the father, just as he embraces and forgives his, his son without a word of, of, of remonstrance, the one who was a wild one, the one who was well behaved to all appearances, but who was secretly uh, self-righteous and, and seeking his own gain by behaving properly, and so he'd get the inheritance. <coughs> he comes out and remonstrates with this. Ever tried to remonstrate with self-righteous people? It's a, quite a job. <laughs> but the father does, and he says, you must come in because my son was lost. We have to rejoice. He couldn't understand that because he, he wanted to be the center of attention. The point is that this father, instead of taking, worrying about his honor, which was very important in that culture, throws away his honor, doesn't act as, as the typical patriarchal father, but rather acts as a mother and forgives both sons and his only request is that they live together in peace and harmony and love each other. So again, the, the gospel is terribly simple. To love one another as I have loved you. And this is what St. Therese practically tried to do on a day-to-day -day basis. And one wonders if this isn't the best project. Because anybody can do it. Everybody has an everyday life. It's just when it gets to that moral corruption starts coming in that makes us think, well, maybe there's a better way than this. There isn't. The kingdom of God is in everyday life and in what you do with it. And if you put love into it, you will certainly be transformed according to Teresa's teaching. She certainly was. And then you have to hold on when into daily life becomes physical, mental, emotional difficulties for yourself or for others. But this, this is to open you to deeper self-knowledge and to deeper self-surrender to God. 
And finally, you may struggle with what is perhaps most difficult for someone sincerely seeking God, the inability to overcome your faults, perhaps your sins. But again, according to the parable of the leaven, the kingdom is right there. And perhaps what you have to do is to accept the humiliation of not being as good as you'd like for now and doing the best you can and trusting to audacity in the Father's goodness. Boundless confidence in the love of God and in the power of that love to work through you to heal the wounds of a lifetime and to heal as many people as possible in your own acquaintanceship. Not you, but the love of God in you is, is, the he is that healing power which has no, no limit. It's not limited to physical healing to emotional healing, even to spiritual healing. It's rather the healing of love, which is the ultimate healing of setting in order charity within us so that no matter what our difficulties are, we continue always to show love, to forgive, to build instead of tear down, to have mercy. <laughs>